Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Road channel. Lately I have been alternating reviews with the more analytical videos, things like history and so on, because the latter seem to get more views. The other purpose is to promote other writers and to promote writing of the steampunk variety in particular. So I'm kind of torn about that. Last time I did a sci-fi review of the very popular kind of cult classic, Red Rising. Uh, this time I've got another review because I came upon this book that I just had to talk about. And I'll tell you why. Now, this book is published just in 2023 from Fairwood Press. And it was picked up by Band Books, which is a pretty big company. But they have a lot of kind of maverick authors with maverick ideas in there, which is one of the things I love about them. So unlike Red Rising, that series, which I spoke of earlier, this one's brand new. It's got no sequels and it's rather obscure. The author, however, has written other books and she got the Hugo and Locus Awards for her 2015 short story, Cat Pictures, Please, which I have not read, but it sounds amusing. The reason the book is so special is that it has a libertarian theme from a non-libertarian standpoint. Though it's not exactly a hit piece either, at least not in my view. The name of the book is Liberty's Daughter by Naomi Kritzer. The protagonist of Liberty's Daughter is a 16-year-old girl named Rebecca Garrison, who calls herself Beck. Kind of a cute nickname. She lives on the Seastead, which is a group of sea platforms and decommissioned ships anchored to the seabed west of California, just outside the 200-mile two mile, rather, economic zone of U.S. territorial waters. Now, this is an idea that's been kicking around in libertarian circles for a long time now, probably as long as I've been involved. And the idea is to create our own society where we can make our own rules, or lack thereof. In fact, The Seastead was the background for my first attempt at a novel something like 40 years ago. Never finished it. Maybe I'll have to come back to that idea. The Seastead is called The Stead by its inhabitants, and it acts kind of like an independent nation, or rather a collection of independent villages. I think there's probably no more than like 20 or 30,000 people total. I don't know if they ever say. In fact, who would know? <laughs> people would be resistant to a census at a place like that. Anyway, it's not recognized by any other countries, of course, because you know, nation states are very jealous of their right to monopolize force. So each of the towns in the Seastead complex has its own rules and system, from Beck's home, New Minerva, called Min for short, which has a ruling council, though they're very laissez-faire type of guys, to Lib, which I think may be short for Libertaria, though I don't recall seeing that full name, which is a completely anarcho-capitalist system, which has no law whatsoever, and Beck describes it as terrifying. Two other notables are Hedonia, which is locally called Amsterdarn. Very corny. I was cringing hearing it so many times. It's called that by the locals. It's a tourist haven of casinos, brothels, and opium dens, which is essentially made to se separate Americans from their money. And Silicon Waters, which is an independent HQ of a secretive nanotech corporation, and it's off limits to all non employees. And they call it Sal for short. I'm not quite sure why. There's another one called Rosa, and I think there may be some others. Beck lives with her father in an apartment on Min. Her mother supposedly died in a car accident way back when Beck was two, so she doesn't even remember her. Shortly after that, Paul Garrison was accused of tax evasion in the U.S., and he emigrated to the Seastead, where he and his daughter have lived ever since. My necessity, life on the stead, as they call it, is very different than stateside. The biggest problem is lack of space. Very few apartments have proper kitchen facilities, so most of the residents subscribe to a cafeteria, which are scattered about the settlements, where they eat most of their meals. Now, there are restaurants, of course, but you can't eat out all the time. So cafeteria, it's almost like living in a company dorm in Asia somewhere. And food is grown in small gardens, with the meat mostly being produced in vats. 
Sounds pretty disgusting. This is like 50 years in the future, so I guess that's practical. Of course, you can't have cattle ranches on the seastead. Drinking water is, of course, desalinated seawater. And a lot of people are employed basically just supporting the infrastructure, keeping the lights on, providing the drinking water, the sanitation, the food, etc., and transportation between towns, some of which don't have walkways, so you have taxi services. And the primary industries, though, are technological. Besides the Secretive Silk and Waters Company, there are also so-called skin farms. Now, this sounds pornographic, but it's not. It involves creating cloned skin for rich Americans to buy to get transplanted over their old, wrinkly, old skin so they can look young. And it's cool technology, but unfortunately, it's dangerous. And so it's banned in the U.S., and it's actually banned in most of the towns in the seas that only Lib allows it because the chemicals that the workers have to work with can cause cancer. So back to Beck, she attends classes with several other teenagers because there's no formal schools on the stead. So parents, you know, hire tutors. There are, you know, organized classes. Various people with various expertise teach, you know, one group or another. So they learn to read and write and math. They're not ignorant like you would expect or you might expect. People did function before government schools were created. Beck has a part-time job, but again, it's kind of different than on the mainland. She is a freelancer, and her position is that of a finder. She locates things for people, uh, like a real-life eBay or Craigslist. Since people have so little space, and since it's expensive to ship goods in, employing a finder is a good way to get something you need without paying for that extra fee. And people have to get rid of stuff because they have very little space. So if you want a nice pair of sandals, you can have a finder find them for you or potting soil or whatever. Beck encounters a lady who has a different proposition. She wants Beck to find her sister who has disappeared and she's worried about her. Since the stead isn't a large place, it's presumably possible for a nosy teenager <laughs> to find this person. So Beck says, yeah, sure, I'll try it. That, unfortunately, brings Beck into contact with the dark side of life on the seastead and gets her into big trouble with her stern, emotionally distant father. This is one of the two story threads in this short book. Beck's quest to find this woman and her subsequent employment by a TV reality show from the USA. The stead has its own reality show called Stead Life, which kind of showcases the quaint and quirky existence in this independent, floating nation. And it's fairly popular in the States. So when one of these film companies in California says, yeah, we can do this. We can profit off of this. So they come here to produce their own. Now, of course, they're going to do something a little different. They're going to offer a reward. And the reward is going to be that people get their bond paid off. Now, this brings us to the dark side of the Seastead system. The bond worker system has nothing to do with 007. <laughs> it's a kind of indentured servitude in which many people enter when they move to the stead because they can't afford to buy a stake, you know, kind of like buying stock in the corporation. Theoretically, they are taking out a loan and they are working off their debt. So in a few years, they should be able to become citizens. Well, in practice, for a lot of people, it doesn't work this way. They seem to be stuck in that debt. Are employers gaming the system? So the idea of this game show was to say we're going to award a full stake in citizenship for the winner and the second winner will get their debts paid off and the rest they'll at least get some money. But the studio people start looking into it and they say well, maybe there's something more nefarious going on here. Maybe we should do an expose instead, which gets them into trouble with the kind of more ruthless elements of the Seastead hierarchy, and including Beck's father, who is kind of a big muckety-muck on New Minerva. At this point, I was starting to think, is this book a critique or an attack? Because the story wasn't quite as nuanced as I'd thought at first. I would like to contrast this book with the much longer and ideologically pure Aristillus series by Travis Corcoran. That's a two-book a series that includes Powers of the Earth and Causes of Separation. 
and it gives a very vivid and detailed description of a libertarian governed moon colony, Aristillus. They have the advantage of anti grav technology, which some independent person discovered and kept to himself <laughs> and didn't let the governments have it, which is, I think, the least plausible aspect of the story. But let's run with it. Aristillus also has the advantage of Mike Martin, who is its founder. He is a very charismatic and principled guy. Well, even though he's a nerd, he's got that nerd charisma, kind of like Elon Musk, who I will compare him to later on. Though Aristillus has some of the same kinds of problems that uh, the Seastead has, I mean, corruption and infighting and so on, they have Mike as their principled leader, uh, informal leader, you know, and he's a powerful protector of their principles. What would happen in a pioneer type community without a Mike Martin? Well, probably something very similar to what happens to the Seastead. Like I said, I liken Mike Martin a bit to Elon Musk. He's into so many things and he inspires a lot of people. Unfortunately, <laughs> in real life, it's difficult to actually do that. I mean, Musk has so many irons in the fire that even his flagship company, Tesla, has its issues. It's got a lot of issues. And I think that's because Musk spreads himself too thin. Getting back to Liberty's daughter. The cool thing about it is, although it shows this libertarian utopia in danger of collapse, it's not entirely unsympathetic. People have good reasons for coming to this place. One character, for example, is facing a 10-year prison sentence for some really minor drug trafficking. Others are just tax evaders, which is, face it, a victimless crime. I mean, look at how high our taxes are and how much of them go to foreign countries like Ukraine, which, let's face it, is doomed. It's a complete waste of our money, and yet we can't do anything about it. No matter how hard we vote, we can't get those scoundrels out. There are less sympathetic people, embezzlers, for example. And there are doctors who lost their licenses and who are now practicing on the stead. Because for some reason, they don't have a good certification program, which they could have in a libertarian society. But... We all know of doctors who have lost their licenses, especially recently, for disagreeing with the basic ideology, you know, especially since 2020. But on the other hand, I think most who lose their license, it's ineptitude or indeed nefarious behavior. So it's a kind of a problem for the CSTAT, for all these um, issues with unvetted people who come in, which brings to mind the idea of how do liberals like Naomi. I assume she supports open borders. The Seastead is having the same sort of problems with unvetted criminals coming in as we get here in the United States with unvetted migrants. <laughs> Interesting point. But nonetheless, Beck views the Seastead as her home. It's a place she wants to live in and stay, and it's a place she wants to save from all its problems. Good for her. She's a great character. She's a resilient teenager with the usual angst, of course, but she's not the kind of mope around and say, oh, poor me. She takes action. She works for her principles. She's a love interest, fellow teenager named Thor, but the two of them are pretty restrained. They don't just jump into a physical relationship like a lot of us would have done at the time. Nobody in particular <laughs> that I can name except myself, perhaps. They don't engage in vices like drugs either, though there's ample opportunity they could easily do that. They're what we call good kids. And so it points to the idea that even in a situation where there's uh, lax rules, people can live good lives, which is a pro-libertarian idea. Another interesting aspect of the book is the relationship of the U.S. government to the stead. This is a big difference from Corcoran's book, because in the Aristotle series, the only thing that's keeping them safe is the fact that the U.S. government doesn't know they exist. As soon as they find out, there is, of course, a financial crisis because the U.S. empire is inept. And I say empire unironically. I call it that now. So Aristillus is a fatted calf that they can slaughter to kick the can down the road a few more months before they become bankrupt. <laughs> kind of like Venezuela eyeing neighboring Guyana saying, we want their oil reserves. That's really our stuff. Uh, when how long do you think it would last them really with their free spending system? Not very long, I think. On the other hand, the government in Liberty's Daughter, the U.S. government, that is, isn't trying to destroy the seastead. They actually have an embassy 
on Numinerva, but it's called the Institute because they can't recognize it as a country. You see this thing a lot in diplomacy, like, oh, we don't recognize Taiwan, for example, so we're going to have a, you know, an institute there, that sort of thing, or Palestine, let's say, that, that, that type of deal. In reality, the institute exists to exploit the extra-legal status of the stead. Uh, think Wuhan, <laughs> for example, and you might, uh, you might have the kind of idea about what's going on here. Now, I don't want to have too much of a spoiler, but one minor quibble I have with this book is the appearance of a vaccine, and I'm sure that Kritzer, knowing her politics, is digging at people like me who are kind of medical skeptics. A more serious quibble I have is the characterization of Lib, a fully anarchist seastead where, quote, murder is legal, unquote. Now, that's not the way that libertarians view it. An anarcho-capitalist society would technically have law. It would be natural law, which, you know, comes from uh, English common law, and it would also derive from the non-aggression principle, which says that thou shalt not initiate force or fraud against other human beings. Now, the problem with this is that although murder is clearly wrong in this case, the question is what to do about it. Uh, do you uh, execute the murderer? I'm fine with that. But there's other cases where you have attempted murder and other less heinous crimes. How do you deal with that? That's the rub with anarcho-capitalism, to be perfectly honest. But I think that Libertaria would at least pay lip service to the NAP, as we call it. All of these philosophical meanderings aside, it's an interesting book, and if you're into comparative politics and political sci-fi, you may like it. If you're a very doctrinaire libertarian, you probably won't. This has been a review of Naomi Kritzer's Liberty's Daughter, and let me know what you think about it in the comments, and please like and subscribe, and please also check out my books on Amazon, Links, as always, are in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Test Road saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Test Road channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.